Okay, welcome back. Um, it's still Tuesday's lecture. We're just now moving on to magnetism. So uh, we finished with electrostatics and we finished with electrodynamics. So um, I, I said before, just for some context, that uh, Maxwell's equations, there are four Maxwell's equations, and um, each of the four Maxwell's equations govern a different aspect of, of electromagnetism. Gauss's law deals with electrostatics, and um, I said Gauss's law for magnetism deals with magnetostatics. We're gonna talk about that briefly, um, shortly. And um, there are other two, there's Ampere's law, and Faraday's law. Ampere's law deals with magnetodynamics and Faraday's law deals with electrodynamics. Now here I am saying that electrodynamics is done and we haven't yet talked about Faraday's law. Um, there's a reason for that. It's because um, it turns out, and we will find this out maybe on Thursday, maybe next Tuesday, um, that really there is no such thing as a changing electric field without also being a changing magnetic field. Um, you can't have one without the other. So they're not actually separate. So it's really hard to talk about electrodynamics in its own isolated form without also talking about magnetodynamics. So I haven't introduced magnetism yet, which means it was next to impossible to talk about Faraday's law because you need some notion of magnetism to talk about Faraday's law. So um, we will have to put a pin in that sort of idea, but we will loop back to it shortly. Okay, magnetism. Um, before you ask, what is magnetism? Um, that's a great question, and I don't actually know how to answer that. Uh, fundamentally, I mean, mag magnetism is not fundamentally known. Um, you know, we don't know how magnetism works. Um, we we have theories, we have a story that we can tell ourselves that makes sense with the evidence that we have. But, you know, if you had to explain the mechanism by which magnets work, there is no answer. Um, the, the answer gets more and more complicated depending at what level you're at. But even at the most high level of things, um, it's, it's still sort of an unknown. So we won't dwell too much on the exact mechanism. I would love to. I would love to be able to teach you that. It's just it's not a thing that is known. Um, so we will just kind of stick to a superficial story. Um, as long as we understand the premise that there is some sort of magnetic force, and you know we've all had experience with like fridge magnets and bar magnets, we can just talk about the properties of what we notice without sort of dwelling on the how. Usually that's what physics is, is dwelling on the how, but unfortunately in this specific instance, we don't know the how. So um, let's talk about the similarities um, that we have with electricity. So bar magnets, we know that there's a north part of the magnet and a south part of the magnet. Could we have, could physicists have labeled this as positive and negative as we did with charges? Yeah, why north and south? Well, good question. Um, I have my theory as to the answer. I can't confirm this. We will find out in a few slides and in about five minutes that um, you cannot have a north pole of a magnet without also having a corresponding south pole. And if we called, you know, instead of north and south, if we use plus and minus just to sort of mimic um, our, our construct for electricity, uh, I feel as though that would be misleading because with electricity, you can have a separate negative charge and you could have a separate positive charge. Yes, I would say overall our, our, our universe is neutral, so there, there are the same number of uh, positives as negatives, but I can separate them. I, I can have a jar full of, well, I can't have a jar full of electrons, but I mean, I, I can have a charged object. You know, I, I could be holding a piece of styrofoam that is negatively charged, right? I am not able to hold a magnet that is just a south pole. That's not possible. So I think physicists did not say positive and negative. They said north and south because they picked a labeling that um, humans might know, like we know what north and south is. But it's also kind of interesting because direction, you can't have one direction. You can't just have north. That's not a thing, right? If there's a notion of, of north, then there has to be a notion of south. If there's a no notion of forward, then there has to be a notion of backwards. You can't have one without the other one. So um, 
I, I think it's an appropriate naming for, for magnetic fields north and south because it implies that there has to be the opposite. If, if there's a north, there has to be a south. So I, my, my suspicion is that's where the naming convention came from. Um, in terms of nomenclature, just to delve a little bit deeper, um, these are called poles of a magnet. So the north, as we say in, in real life with geography, the north pole, the south pole. So we say these are poles of the magnet. And what is similar between uh, electricity and, and magnetism is that the same pole will repel. So a north will repel a north, the south will repel a south, and opposites attract. North will attract a south. Now, let's jump to um, the math for a second. So we recall, come on. All right, I guess I'm writing in red because it will not change to black. Welcome to a Microsoft product. Okay, I guess I'm writing in red from now on. So we will recall Gauss's law was the integral of d dot dA equals Q total over epsilon naught. And we understood over a closed surface. All right, I can't change, right. Uh, we understood that the left-hand side here was flux, and what it did was it counted the number of field lines through surf, uh, a closed surface. So Gauss's law says the number of field lines that go through a closed surface is proportional to the total enclosed charge meaning the more enclosed charge you have, the more field lines are going to go through your surface. That makes sense. Let's look at the math for Gauss's law for magnetism, the second of Maxwell's equations. Well, the left-hand side has a very similar mathematical structure. Instead of E dot dA, we have B dot dA. But all of the same logic still applies. If you take a closed surface, and you add up, however, you add up all of the magnetic field lines, not electric, because it's not E dot dA, it's B dot dA. So if you look at all the magnetic field lines, then the total amount of magnetic field lines that flows through, flows through a surface is going to be zero. And I mean, again, Gauss's law was mind blowing enough. Gauss's law said, if you pick any closed surface, sphere, box, pyramid, prism, um, any closed surface, if you add up the number of field lines that go through it, it's, you're going to get the same answer. It's going to be proportional to the total enclosed charge, whether it's big or small or whatever. That alone was mind-blowing that you could use any surface. This is even more mind-blowing. Not only can you still use any surface, rectangle, circle, square, star, not only can you still use any surface, it doesn't matter what surface you draw, this equation says the total number of field lines that go through any surface, closed surface, will always be zero. That's amazing. That's actually quite a powerful statement. Now, just a point of clarification, I'm introducing a new variable, B. It represents the magnetic field strength you know, for that silent B in magnets. I didn't, I didn't come up with a variable name B, but I'm just using the convention. But yeah, um, so B represents the magnetic field strength in the same way that E was the electric field. Um, e has units of, um, well, it's got a few different units. Um, if you recall, E could be represented as V over D, which could be represented as of volts per meter. Um, the other definition of E is going to be force over Q, uh, which is going to be a Newton per Coulomb. Um, so we didn't really have like a, a, a fundamental, we didn't have a fundamental unit for E. Um, it was just either Newton over Coulomb, or sorry, Newton over Coulomb, not Q, Newton over Coulomb, um, or volts per meter. Um, in this case, we do. It's called a Tesla. So the magnetic field is measured in, in Tesla. 
Now, what does Gauss's law for magnetism say? It's, it pretty much says um, you can't have any magnetic monopoles. And why does it say that? Well, this says if you have a bar magnet, am I able to change color yet? Nope. Uh, if you have a bar magnet, I don't know what the magnetic field looks like, but whatever the magnetic field looks like, if I take uh, a closed box and I enclose this imaginary box, this is a, a sort of a Gaussian surface, then whatever the field lines uh, are going to look like, you know, some of the field lines might be going out, okay? Those would be a positive value, but the sum of all the field lines is zero according to this equation. So that means for every field, uh, for every magnetic field line that goes out of the box, there has to be a field line that comes into the box, which means the field lines have to come back home. That's not true for the electric field. The electric field, the, um, there is a source. The source is Q. Um, this is saying there is no source. And this is actually part of the reason why physicists don't really understand magnetic uh, magnets very well or magnetic fields very well. Um, it's because there is no source. Um, what that means is if there's no source, there's no beginning and there's no end. We know where the beginning of an electric field is. It's a positive charge. We know where the end of an electric field is. It's a negative charge, okay? The fact that Gauss's law for magnetism is equal to zero, always equal to zero, it means you can never just have a north pole. You can never just have a south pole because that would mean there's a source. And get, mathematically, there is no source. So that means if you were to cut a bar magnet in half, then you get two smaller bar magnets. You induce a sort of south pole here and a north pole here. And if you did that again, you again induce a south and a north. And if you do that again here, you induce a south and a north. Now, you can actually see the structure of the magnetic field. And, and had we been in person, I would be able to do this for you in person. Hopefully a science teacher at some point in your life has done this for you. If you take a bar magnet and you put a piece of paper over top of the bar magnet um, and you put iron filings over it, let's say we put iron shavings on the piece of paper, you can see the iron shavings taking this form. So you can actually empirically, empirically meaning with your eyes, um, see and visualize the magnetic field. So we don't even have to guess at what nature is doing. We can see what nature is doing inherently. So um, we have the ability to sort of prove that this is what the, the magnetic field looks like for a bar magnet. And this is what I mean by Gauss's law for magnetism, meaning all the field lines must come home, meaning there can't be a source, meaning you can't have a magnetic monopole. You see here, if you trace any field line you want, take any field line, you see here how it goes mostly parallel through the bar magnet. It, it leaves the bar magnet out of the north pole. You see the arrow here. But then it loops back around into the south end. It's a continuous loop. It's not a perfect circle, but it's a loop. That does not happen with the electric field. The electric field, if you were to trace it, you just go out forever. Okay, it doesn't necessarily come back home. Or, and it may not go forever, it may go from the positive charge to the negative charge and end up the negative charge. But that's still an ending. It doesn't come back home. There's no closed loop. Now, um, the Earth has its own magnetic field, which is kind of interesting. Um, the interesting thing about Earth is what we call the North Pole is actually magnetic south. We call the, the Arctic, the north, we call that north because that is where uh, a compass, that's where the north part of a compass points. So we say, oh, the north part of a compass points what we call to be north. That is a natural thing um, to think. However, if you think about it, um, north-south, north-south, um, this would repel each other. Right? So if, if the north part of our, our, our compass 
points what we call to be north, inherently it's attracted to geographic north. If it's attracted to geographic north, then that means the North Pole is actually magnetic south. That's the only way our, our bar magnet in our compass will, will be attracted to it. So geographic north and magnetic north are opposite. Magnetic north is Antarctic, magnetic south is Arctic. Geographic north is Arctic, geographic south is Antarctic. So that's kind of a little fun twist for you to think about. And depending on what configuration you have with magnets, you can get different magnetic fields. But of course, they, they will always come home. So if you have like a U magnet, which you might see, or a horseshoe magnet that you may have seen before, um, your magnetic field looks different than that of a bar magnet. It looks kind of like this. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, but Mark, you know, this is, this is no different than having like a positive and a negative charge. You know, if you had a proton and an electron, then, you know, you would get, you'd get an electric field that looks something similar. Um, you're, you're right, sort of, right? You have to remember though, with a, with a positive and negative charge, you'd also get the same pattern on the bottom, right? All the field lines go from a beginning of the positive to the end of the negative. However, with the magnetic field, they travel inside the magnet back home. So they still have that sort of complete loop. So here's what I am talking about in terms of magnetic flux. So the left hand side of Gauss's law for magnetism is B dot dA is, well, is equal to zero. So the, this is the left hand side and the left hand side is equal to flux. So we've already talked about flux before. We've already given it the symbol phi or phi capital phi in the Greek language. Um, but for the electric flux, we said phi sub E. For the magnetic flux, we're gonna say phi sub B, flux magnetic. But it's the same notion. It, it's just counting how many field lines are coming in. And if the flux is equal to zero for a closed surface, what that means is just, if you have four field lines coming in, then you're gonna have four field lines going out which means what comes in goes out, which means there's no source. There's nothing in there generating the B field. It just kind of flows through you. Um, now in this class, as I've sort of explained with Gauss's law, you have to be very careful with how you pick your surface. Um, in this class, we are not gonna need calculus. We're gonna pick very easy surfaces. Um, in general, you can pick oblong shapes that are kind of squiggly, um, that would need calculus to integrate over um, the angles between the angles between the field and the surface might be different everywhere. That just gets complicated. You're going to need calculus for that, and that's no fun. So we're not going to do that in this class. Everything in this class is going to be nice and smooth and constant. So we're you know in this class we're either going to talk about areas. Can I change color now? Nope, still not. So in this class um, we're going to talk about you know probably like cubes because those are pretty easy and um, all of the angles are going to be constant so all of the angles are either going to be zero or all of the angles are going to be something something like 30 degrees or something like that um, it'll be something pretty straightforward so um, we can do the same trick we did with gauss's law um, as we do for this equation for magnetism if we assume the b field is constant over the integral if we assume the angles constant over the integral then we can say the integral of b dot dA is equal to b cos theta times the integral of dA, because if they're constant in the integral, you can pull them out, and then the integral of dA is simply A, so we're gonna get b A cos theta, which is what I'm saying here. So in this class, in 137, um, this is the equation we're gonna use. So, um, believe it or not, that's pretty much the extent of Gauss's law for magnetism. Um, it's powerful, it's cool, it's just boring. Um, it's boring because the right-hand side equals zero. There's really not a lot you can do mathematically with that equation. The right-hand side is zero. So beyond just kind of concluding conceptually that there is no source, everything has to come back home, um, there's really not much you can do. It's not a very useful equation in, in that sense. 
So um, very quickly, we can actually just move right along to a third Maxwell equation. And uh, well, actually, this is labeled mostly as a fourth, but we, we haven't done Faraday's law yet. Um, but let's move right along to uh, introducing um, uh, Ampere's law. So Ampere's law governs magneto part of, well, I guess it's one of two halves that govern magnetodynamics. Faraday's law is the other one. Now, interestingly, with, with Ampere's law, this is kind of what reveals a little bit of, of insight into the sort of coupled nature between E and B. Ampere's law is written like this. The integral of B dot dx is equal to mu naught, mu naught being some constant, just like epsilon naught, times the total enclosed current. So what does this say? Mathematically, yeah, you can write it down, you can memorize it. I know if you take chemistry with, with uh, Professor Poey, she makes you memorize the first 40 or something like that elements on the periodic table. Could you memorize this equation? Yes. Is that useful to memorize this equation? No. Um, I don't want you to memorize it. I want you to sort of look at the math and see what you can understand from the math. So what is this saying? This is saying, mathematically, if the right-hand side is, is non-zero, then inherently the left-hand side is non-zero. Okay, why is that significant, Mark? Well, what does it mean for the right-hand side to be non-zero? Well, it means there's a current. Mu naught's just a constant, so that, that can't not be zero. So if the right-hand side is zero, it means there's some sort of current. Okay, current is a moving charge, right? So this is sort of the tie-in between the electro unit and this unit. Now, if there's an occurrent, then that really means this integral is non-zero. Now, if that integral is non-zero, B might be zero somewhere temporarily, but overall, if the net integral is non-zero, then you, you must understand mathematically that in general, B is non-zero. It has to be, because if B was just flat zero everywhere, then the integral would be zero. So really what this is saying is actually quite interesting. Ampere's law is saying, if there's a non-zero current, then there's a non-zero B field, which is really cool. I mean, here you are talking about, we just got finished talking about currents. We did Kirchhoff's law, Ohm's law. We talked about capacitors, right? All of these things are properties of current and current is just a moving charge. It's just, you know, an electron that moves across a wire or doesn't even have to be in a wire. You know, in, in a particle accelerator, you can, you can shoot charged particles, you know, through a vacuum and accelerate them, um, you know, in a loop. This is saying a moving charge, which is the definition of a current, a moving charge will generate a B field. That's incredible because, you know, a stationary charge, like a positive charge, for instance, we already know is going to emit an E field inherently. And even if that charge is moving, just because the charge is moving doesn't mean it's not going to generate an E field. So even if that charge, can I change color yet? Nope. I'm going to try, hold on, I'm just going to try minimizing this briefly. And can I change? Ah, now I can change color. Okay, so uh, there we go. So even if this charge is moving, it still generates the E field. But Ampere's law says if the charge is moving, it will also generate, if V is not equal to zero, it will also generate a B field. And that's just incredible. You can actually get a B field from a charge. Now, this doesn't mean you might be thinking, oh, well, Mark, then that's the source. We now know what the source of the B field is. Mystery solved. Well, sort of. But um, just because we know how to generate a B field doesn't mean we know what causes the B field. Why is it the movement that causes the B field? Well, you could say it's relativity and that a magnetic field is actually just a, 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 a way to compensate for, for non for, for non-stationary electric fields, which is one interpretation of it. Um, 
we still don't know. Like, whatever B field it generates, it will have to still loop back on itself. It has to. So we, we still don't know why. Why does it have to loop back on itself? Why do, why do there has to be a monopole? We still don't know that. But anyway, it's really cool that you can get a B field from, from a charge. Now, um, what does it look like? Right, we know a moving charge will generate a B field. What does that B field look like? So let's look. We, we predict this, you can't see blue. We predict this using our right hand. I think physicists are inherently right-handed. Um, I'm personally left-handed myself, evidenced by me holding the pen in my left hand. So um, learning physics was always hilarious for me. I'm also very dyslexic, so it, it actually wasn't a problem because I'm, I'm okay thinking with my right hand as well as my left hand because I mix them up anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so how do you predict the, the form of the B field? With your right hand rule. So for instance, if you have a loop of wire, not a straight wire yet, we will talk about that shortly. Let's say you have a loop of wire. Then if you have a current that travels this way as shown uh, in the picture, the structure of the magnetic field is given by your right hand. So we see here that if you were to take a slice, a slice, let's take like a slice here, and zoom in, zoom in on the slice. Then the magnetic field from that one slice is going to look like concentric circles. What you do with your right hand is you grab the wire with your right hand. So um, you, you grab, oh, well, I don't know. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen momentarily. And then that way you can see um, the video in your whole window. So if you take, um, actually, let's do this. If you take the wire, which uh, right now is kind of vertical in the camera, let's say the current is traveling up in the wire. Okay, right now this is the, the charging wire for the tablet. If, if the wire, if the current in the wire is going straight up, the right hand rule for magnetism is grab the wire with your right hand in such a way that your thumb will point in the direction of the current in the wire. So I'm pretending the current in the wire is traveling up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna aim my right thumb up and I'm gonna grab the wire. And when you grab the wire, your fingernails, when they wrap around the wire, your fingernails are going to point in the direction of the magnetic field. And when you wrap your fingers around the wire, you see how your fingers kind of curl into a circle. They're circular. So that, is sort of why we use, let me just reshare, let me just reshare this for you. Okay, so this is why we use the right hand rule because we know they have to loop around home and your fingers have to loop around home when they curl them around and your fingernails coincidentally, there's nothing about the human body or evolution that we haven't evolved to specifically predict the the right, uh, the, the magnetic field with our right hand. I mean, the, those are complete, that's a complete coincidence that our right hand does the job very well. But what you do is when you, um, let me erase this, when you wrap your fingers around like this, your fingernails are going to point in the direction. Oops. Come on, scroll. There we go. Your fingernails are going to point in the direction of the magnetic field. So it kind of tells you where north is and where south is. So that's what a, a wire segment looks like. That's what the B field looks like for a, a straight wire. If you were to then take this wire and loop it back on itself, right, like what we had here originally, then what you get is one particular section is going to loop around. And then down here, same thing. The current is going to be into the page. So if I take my right hand, finger into the board, wrap your fingernails around, you're going to get, oop, I just right clicked. You're going to get something that looks like this. Maybe I should draw, maybe I should draw these in a different color. Okay, so you see here that at the center of this loop, you have every single component, every single millimeter of wire is producing a magnetic field to the right at the center of the loop. So they superimpose and what happens at the center of the loop is you get a really strong north pole 
and a really strong south pole, um, you know, generated by this loop. And then outside of the loop, it's fringe, it's, it's weaker. So outside of the loop, you know, they do loop around home, but it's really weak. It's really weak out here. And in the middle, it's really strong. Okay, because they, they superimpose superposition of, of waves. So they, they superimpose and get really strong. So that's kind of how you can picture the magnetic field both due to an infinitely straight wire and then what happens when you bend, how you can use that information to predict what it is when you bend the wire into a loop. Okay, now, what's gonna happen if you put um, a, wire, a current carrying wire in a pre-existing magnetic field? Well, we do know already that a moving charge will produce a magnetic field. We know this is true from Ampere's law. We've already established that a moving charge will create a magnetic field. And we also know from bar magnets that the north will repel the north and the south will repel the south. So I don't know what this magnetic field would look like necessarily from a single charged particle that is moving, but it will generate some sort of B field. And what all that's happening here is you have a bunch of charges in a wire that are moving. So like, let's say we have one charge that's moving this way. That one charge that's moving will be generating its own magnetic field, B. And as that charge flows through the region where the magnet is kind of overlapping the wire, the B field from the magnet and the B field from the moving charge will interfere with one another. The, the, wherever the north happens to go, it will repel. So there will, be a, there will literally be a force, as if you're pushing a table or pushing a chair, there will literally be a force acting on this positive charge within the wire. And you know, what happens if you pull the thing inside the, uh, you know, if you have water flowing in a pipe, and let's say you were like magic somehow, and you were able to like exert a force of water on the pipe. Well, actually, I don't even have to say magic, gravity, Gravity works on, the, on, on water in a pipe. You know, if you, if you lift up a hose with water in it and the water is flowing through the hose, you have this, this action at a distance. You have this, this force at a distance that is acting on the water. And if you were to, you know, to let go of the hose, the gravity on the, of, of the water will pull the water down, which inherently will pull the hose down. There'll be a force on the hose itself. That's what's happening here. You have a force on the charge inside the wire. And what that does is, the, the, the charges go to move upwards or downwards or somewhere. The charges go to physically move, but they hit the wire and then kind of pull the wire along with them. So the result of this is you can conceptually, you can conceptually predict that a wire carrying a current will be able to feel a force by a magnet. Now, again, through empirical observations, surprise, you can predict that force with your right hand. We will get back to that shortly. Um, okay, back to Ampere's law for a second. I'm building, I'm, I'm telling you a story, so I'm building here. I'm giving you a lot of tidbits of information, but I am going somewhere with it. Ampere's law. Let's, let's kind of nitpick this a little bit. Just like Gauss's law, we can relate the structure of the B field to some sort of source. And again, you're probably saying, Mark, you said you don't know the sources of B field. You're right. Fundamentally, we don't know what causes, there is, well, there is nothing that causes the B field, right? There is no positive magnetic pole that, or negative magnetic pole that causes it, right? It's something more complicated than that. But we do know that if you have a moving charge, it will induce um, a closed 
B field, right? So this says, just like Gauss's law, if you integrate, if you integrate around a closed loop, could be a square, it could be a box, it could be a triangle, it could be a circle, anything that's a closed loop, not an area. Notice this is dx, not dA. So we're integrating over a line, we're not integrating over a surface. If you enclose any current in your loop, then you're going to get a B field, a, a non-zero B field. So what that means, for instance, is like, let's say, um, well, actually, let me just scroll down to here. If you take an extension cord, I don't know if you've ever done this, uh, unless you're kind of more solid with physics and electricity, I would recommend not doing it because um, you could shock yourself. But you know, if you are comfortable with it or whatever, ask a professional, you could do this. If you slice open the sheathing, of an extension cord, um, you're going to probably see three wires, right? You know, you know, an extension cord looks something like, or the plug on an extension cord looks something like a face screaming, right? Here we have the positive end. Um, you know, here we have the negative end, and then here we have the grounding pin, the grounding pin or the grounding wire. So you've got three wires that are sort of wrapped together in this extension cord. If you were to cut open the sheathing like I've shown here in this diagram, then here you see the negative cord. Here you see the negative cord, here you see the positive cord, and here you see the grounding cord. Well, what this is saying is, if you can draw a loop, what color do I want to draw my loop? I've used all my colors. I'll just use I'll use red. If no, that thing is red. I'll use green. If you can physically create a loop that encompasses, encompasses, encloses a wire, Ampere's law says if you integrate the magnetic field or add up the magnetic field along this closed loop, it's called an Amperian. It's called an Amperian loop. If you add up the B field along that Amperian loop, it will be proportional to the total enclosed current, which is pretty much the same idea as Gauss's law. So there's actually um, a very commonly used tool in, in practice, in real life, to measure current indirectly. And it uses this using Ampere's law. And it absolutely, I mean, I, I fully understand how this works, it, but it still blows my mind. Maybe it blows my mind because I understand how it works. But, um, you know, if you ever call an electrician to look at something and they're, they're trying to see if a wire is live, well, how do you test if a wire is live? Well, I mean, a, a naive way of testing that is to just touch it to something to see if it sparks. Well, that's dangerous, right? Um, sometimes it's not even feasible, right? If the, if the wires are kind of connected and, and buried in the wall or, you know, you don't want to cut the wire to see, to test it, right? You want to be able to test to see if there's current flowing in the wire without interrupting the circuit. And um, Ampere's law allows us to do that. So electricians often have this sort of device here. It's, it's a version of an ammeter, measures current, but it measures current indirectly. It doesn't measure current by having current flow through it. What it does is there's a bunch of magnetic sensors. There's a bunch of magnetic sensors in the red clamp here. And it senses the magnetic field. And what that can do is it can, it can integrate, it can add up the total amount of magnetic field strength it feels over that closed loop. And then it can use Ampere's law. Ampere's law is programmed into this device to reverse engineer what the current is flowing through that wire. Now, I have a video here. Let's, um, let's see if we can watch it. Now, can I, let's see here. I could just go to YouTube. Hold on, I'm gonna have to share a different screen though if we go to YouTube, give me a sec. 
YouTube, there we go. So um, it's only two, two and a half minute video. So let's take a pause and, and watch this and, and see if you can sort of um, follow the logic of what this guy is saying. Now this guy isn't a physicist, really. He's not gonna mention Ampere's law. But now that I've shown you Ampere's law and the logic behind how you can use um, you know, Ampere's law to, to indirectly calculate current in a wire, see if you can sort of understand that notion in, in this video. I'm Mike Sokol, and welcome to the How To RV Seminars, where we will learn all about RV electrical preparedness. Today's episode is about how to use a clamp-on ammeter to determine current flow in a wire. And I have a Fluke 322 in front of me. Uh, costs less than $100. And what I'm going to do is turn this on to amperage mode. You can see I have a little spring-loaded grabby jaw here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and hook it around a wire that's running a little space heater. Now, even though that space heater is drawing four or five amperes because it's a 600 watt heater, I'm still showing zero amperes of current. And that's because inside of an extension cord, we have multiple wires. So I have a black wire, a white wire, and a green wire. And even though the black wire is probably carrying four or five amperes of current, the white wire is also carrying an equal but opposite four or five amperes of current, and that adds together to, to produce the zero reading. So let me show you. If I go and hook around only the black wire, now I'm reading about 4.2 amperes. It's exactly what we expect. And if I hook only around the white wire, I'm reading about the same 4.2 amperes of current. If I clamp around the green wire, I should have next to nothing. And there it is showing as 0 0.01, and that's just within calibration of the instrument. So again, if you're clamped around the entire extension cord, it will null out to zero. If you clamp around the hot wire, it will show you the true current of the system, or around the white wire will show you the true current in the system. Thanks for watching the How To RV videos. Please subscribe to this channel. Okay, so that was just um, an example of kind of what I meant with Ampere's law and really reinforcing total enclosed current. What he was saying there was um, if you include both the white and the black wire, you have, you know, uh, current traveling, you have I traveling to the left, but you also have I traveling to the right. So the total current enclosed is I minus I, which is zero. So if you, if you use Ampere's law and you encompass a total current of zero, then the net B field that you experience will be zero. And if you only enclose one of the three wires or one of the two black or white wires, um, your total enclosed current is non-zero, so you're going to feel a non-zero B field. And that's just really cool to think about, I think. It's, it's super cool. So um, anyway, that's, that's a cool thing. Um, you actually get the sort of idea from power lines as well. I mean, you may have heard growing up, you know, oh, there's radiation in power lines and some people saying, no, it's perfectly safe. Um, what they're referring to, I'm, I'm not gonna take a stance on whether or not they're safe. Um, I don't think this is the platform for that. I actually, I'm not even convinced the science is totally done proper investigations on it. I mean, it might very well be perfectly safe. It may not be, I don't know, but if you want to be more informed about what this debate is about, at least, um, you should you should know that it's not like, you know, radiation from uranium or radioactive radiation, right? It's what is this radiation? There are currents in these power lines, very high voltage currents in these power lines, and um, currents we know generate a, a magnetic field and the charges themselves, the individual charges will generate their own electric field. So the radiation that they're referring to is the electromagnetic waves that are produced from these, um, from these, from these wires. 
partially from the electric field that is generated by the charges inherently themselves. And because there's a current, there's a movement of these charges, um, you know, there, there's a magnetic, there's a magnetic aspect to this as well. So that's, that's what the debate is about. Um, now, generally, we're, we're blasted with electromagnetic radiation all the time. I mean, light is one, is one example of electromagnetic radiation. Um, cell phone signals, I mean, there's also debate about the health of cell phone signals, but cell phone signals are, are mostly in the microwave range, mostly, um, sort of in the radio range. And, uh, but again, they're, they're an example of EM waves. So uh, not all electromagnetic radiation is harmful, but some of it is, you know, like you can get sunburnt, use ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light is, is above violet. Our eyes can't see it, but it's still electro, it's still light nonetheless. And it's light that will damage us and is unhealthy for us. So uh, x-rays are another one. You know, we use x-rays in medical imaging all the time, but its, it's risks are well known. The prolonged exposure of x-rays will cause cancer. So, you know, the, the debate about radiation causing harm is, is not a frivolous one and it should not be quickly dismissed. I mean, there are lots of examples of safe EM waves and there's lots of examples of dangerous EM waves. So it's, it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, light doesn't hurt us, therefore we're good. It's, it's more complicated than that. Okay, another aspect of Ampere's law. So I've already shown you a video where uh, you can use Ampere's law to reverse engineer the current inside of a wire. Now, you know that we can actually use wires to transmit information, right? So cable, for instance, you know, like if you use Rogers cable, um, you might've seen something like this before. The official name for this is called a coaxial cable. Coaxial, axial meaning like axis, co meaning like multiple. So coaxial means there's two axes uh, in this cable. Now this is, the design of this cable is very, very intentional. Um, how do we transmit information across wires? Well, we encode the information in the electrical signal. What is electrical signal? Well, electrical signal is just current, right? So if you can actually use Ampere's law to reverse engineer what the current in a wire is, without even cutting the wire, right? If you're, if you're trying to intercept a secret message and you cut the wire to install your own listening device, then both parties are gonna know the wire was cut for a brief moment in time. And then you could re reconnect them through your device, but they would still know that the wire was cut. So Ampere's law is sort of a way that you could use to spy on somebody because you don't have to cut the wire to reverse engineer the signal. And then if there was a pattern in the signal, you could decode the pattern presumably. With a coaxial cable, it's really ingenious because um, you know, e even with an extension cord, you could cut the sheathing and then separate the, the different cords inside one another without, again, without damaging the signal, without damaging the flow of power. A coaxial cable is a brilliant, ingenious um, uh, design because what they do with the coaxial cable is the outer perimeter is actually a hollow conductor. It's a hollow tube conductor. Now it's flexible, like it's a wire, it can bend, but it's a conductor. So there is current that actually flows along the outer surface of, of a coaxial cable. Now, of course, a coaxial cable, cable is covered in, in a very thin layer of rubber or some sort of plastic. But if you were to kind of peel away the plastic, you would immediately see this conductor. And inside, buried within the hollow aspect, you can see it here, there is an inside conductor. Now, all it takes is two wires to complete the circuit. One positive wire going to the item, whether it be the modem or the TV, and then a second one to go back home, back to Rogers, right? You need to complete the circuit. So this is how a coaxial cable can complete the circuit without risk of anyone being able to decipher the information. Even if you cut away the sheathing on a coaxial cable, you are not able to do, you are not able to do what this guy did. Okay, you're not able to, to cut the sheathing and, and isolate individual parts of the wire. 
because in order to do that, you would literally have to break the wire to get inside of it. So even if you try to use that clampy thing, even if you try to use that, um, that uh, clampy thing that he had, right? Um, that device with numbers on it, uh, that wouldn't work because when you encompass the coaxial cable, it is 100% of the time that the total enclosed current is always zero. Now, why did they invent the coaxial cable? It wasn't for spies. You know, how many people go around digging up phone lines to try to figure out, you know, decipher messages, right? It's not espionage. Um, really, another implication of Ampere's law says, um, we, we know B fields will interact with each other, right? Um, we know a moving charge will generate a B field. So presumably, uh, electrical devices that carry a current, they can be negatively impacted by external magnetic fields. If you're having technical support and you call tech support, they always ask you like, oh, well, you know, have you moved the base away from other wireless devices? You know, if you have your modem right beside your wireless phone, they might say, oh, well, move, move your router somewhere else or move your phone somewhere else. Move the base station for your wireless phone somewhere else. The premise of that uh, piece of advice is that your phone is a wireless piece of technology emitting a very powerful electromagnetic signal. And if it's next to um, your Wi-Fi, uh, it might interfere with the Wi-Fi. So, the whole premise of having a coaxial cable um, is, is that because it doesn't produce any net B field outside of the cord, then no external B field can affect it. Because it, it, overall, the net B field is zero. And, and then that inherently means that um, uh, other B fields, like if, if you hold a north magnet to it, it's not going to do anything because it itself is not, it does not have a net B field. So, this design was not to prevent espionage per se. It was to increase robustness and reliability of, of the purpose of it is to carry information. Okay, now let's get back to base, uh, back to, to, well, yeah, basics, but the nitty gritty. We know the electric force, you can't see that. We know the electric force is F equals QE. All right, we've seen this sort of force field relationship. Um, we also see this with gravity, by the way. The force of gravity is m times the gravitational field, where, where g is the gravitational field. Now, close to the Earth's surface, the gravitational field is constant. It's just 9.8. In general, however, the gravitational field is, is not constant. Uh, in general, the gravitational field is g mass of the source over r squared. So we've seen the sort of coupling between force and field um, uh, quite often. So by that same logic, if we have a new force now, we have like a magnetic force, then we know it's going to be the uh, following the same pattern. Because I, I said before that every natural force that exists in naturally in nature, gravity, electric, magnetic, it's going to follow this sort of force field relationship. So um, we know this is going to be the magnetic field. So the question here is, um, what goes there to complete that equality? It's force magnetic equals something times B. What is that something? Well, in gravity, uh, well, okay, that, that something is the intrinsic property of, of what we're talking about. So for gravity, the intrinsic property is mass. Okay. For, for the electric force, the intrinsic property is charge. Right? We don't talk about the mass of a charge. We talk about how much charge the charge has. Okay. So for magnetism, what's the intrinsic part of magnetism? A moving charge. That's the intrinsic part of magnetism. It's a moving charge. It's not charge by itself, and it's not speed by itself. It's a moving charge, QV. So using the same idea of force field relationship, we can almost immediately say, oh boy, we can almost immediately say with very little math 
that the, the new force is going to be equal to QB, sorry, QV times B. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, um, where's the sine theta coming in? Well, V is a vector, B is a vector, um, and you can't just multiply vectors, right? That's not a thing. So there's only two ways to combine vectors. There's a dot product and a cross product. You know a dot product will produce a scalar, and a force is a vector, right? So we know the answer has to be a vector, and we know a dot product would produce a scalar. So by that logic, you know that this has to be a cross product. And um, the way in which you can represent a cross product is a b sine theta, or I guess in this case, uh, v cross b is going to be v b, v b sine theta. That's going to be v, v cross b is v b sine theta. So there's your equation for magnetic force. F magnetic equals v, uh, q v b sine theta. So in the four minutes we have left, uh, I'm going to do at least one example with you, maybe two, and then we're going to call it a day. But I want to leave you with some sort of worked example so you can, uh, you're better equipped at tackling some homework problems. So here's an example. A uniform magnetic field B points horizontally from the south to the north. So um, from the south to the north. So here is, um, oh, well, sorry, a horizontal B field. Okay, well. Um, it's because the Earth is round that I'm having trouble picturing this. So I, it says horizontal. So I'm just going to draw a horizontal B field and say this is north and this is south. Um, and has a magnitude of 1.5 Tesla. OK, so the B field has a magnitude of 1.5 Tesla. By the way, that's a strong magnetic field. Um, one Tesla is an amazingly strong magnetic field. Usually, just for context, we're talking about magnetic fields that are like 10 to the minus 3. Um, like a bar magnet is probably 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6 in terms of field strength for Teslas. So a one Tesla magnetic field is, is quite strong, um, probably dangerously strong, actually. Um, for context, an MRI machine is about, mm, about 7 to 10 Tesla, maybe even as powerful as 12 Tesla. It's pretty powerful, which is why when you go take an MRI, they make sure you don't have fillings, they make sure you don't have earrings or necklaces on, because if you, if you had an earring, it would literally pull it right out of your ear and it would be very painful. So anyway, that, that aside. Um, if a proton uh, with a certain amount of kinetic energy moved vertically downward through the field, what force will act on it? Note the mass of the proton is given. So if we have a proton that is moving physically this way, v vector, um, they want to know what force is acting on it. Okay, so the force magnetic is QVB sine theta. And Q, we know Q is going to be the charge on, on a proton, which is the same as that on an electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. But instead of being negative, it's positive. Um, v, do we know the speed? Oh, crap. We don't know the speed. OK, we'll, we'll come back to this later. Um, we do know the, the Q, though. And B, do we know the B? Yeah, we do. We know the B. And sine theta. Do we know the theta? Well, the theta is the angle between speed and B. So speed is down, speed is down, and the B field is right. What's the angle? 90 degrees. So yes, we, we know theta. So the only thing we don't know here is V. Well, what other piece of information in the question are we given to help us find V? Ah, it's kinetic energy. So we also know that the kinetic energy, we have the kinetic energy, and we also know that that's 1 half m proton v proton squared. So we can actually solve for the speed of the proton. And it's going to be the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy divided by the mass of the proton. So we can plug that in here. And we're going to get q times root 2 ek over mass of the proton b. And sine theta, we know theta is 90. Sine of 90 is 1. So I don't necessarily need to write times 1. 
Okay, so there's your answer. There's the force on, uh, on the proton. Now, that's the magnitude of force. We have not talked about the direction of the force. Um, we will talk about that uh, in more detail tomorrow, but very briefly, the way you, you discuss the force is just by analyzing a simple cross product. So if you recall, um, the cross product is you, you, you look at the direction of the cross product with your right hand as we did with torque. So, um, you know, if you, have, if you have V cross B, uh, in order to compute that, you use your right hand, you point your fingernails in the direction of the first vector, so V cross B, you point your fingernails in the direction of V, and then you curl them in the direction of B, and, uh, and then you, your, your thumb points in the direction of the cross product. Okay, so um, V cross B, your thumb is gonna point out of the page. Okay, so the, the, the vector direction of this will be out of the page. So this means this is the magnitude of the force um, and the, the, um, the direction of the, of the, um, the direction of the force will be out of the page. So this would be, is it minor? Yeah, so this would be out of page. Okay, so there you go. You, and you obtain this using, using right hand rule. Okay, okay, so um, thanks for coming out. Um, we're gonna talk about, again, like I said, more about the vector nature of this cross product uh, in tomorrow's lecture. So, um, but for now, hopefully we've, we've covered a lot. We've covered two of Maxwell's equations in one lecture, um, Gauss's law for magnetism, which says there are no magnetic monopoles, and we've covered Ampere's law that says if you have a moving charge, it will generate a B field, which is kind of really cool. So um, there's lots of material to review. There's lots of practice problems to practice. Um, in addition to that, we also covered a new type of force, magnetic force, QVB sine theta. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff for you to practice. And I know you have a midterm coming up on, on Friday as well. So there's no shortage of, of material to work on. Um, again, you can reach out to your TA for extra support. Um, and if, if uh, also myself, if, if um, you know, they aren't responding in time or you need more, more time or more help than they're, they're able to offer. So thanks for coming out. Um, stop the recording now. And for those of you watching on YouTube later, I will see you in the next video.